Good morning and welcome to today's SMOCO session brought to you by Northwest Local Land Services. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the land on which we meet today. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Today's session will be focused on compromised ground cover, what it is, what it means for your enterprise and how you can successfully complete a compromised ground cover notification under the Land Management Native Vegetation Code 2018. I'm Sally Poole and I'm joined by Caleb Doyle. We're both Senior Land Service Officers based in Moree and we are here to help you navigate native vegetation legislation and regulation in New South Wales. If you have any questions throughout, please put them in the comments and we'll do our best to answer them at the end of the presentation. Firstly, a little background information before we dive into the detail of compromised ground cover notifications. It's important to remember when we are talking about native vegetation or plants native to New South Wales that it's comprised of three strata levels, trees, shrubs and ground cover. All native vegetation in all strata in the proposed treatment area or paddocks need to be considered. You might not be aware that clearing of native ground cover usually requires some kind of approval in the same way that clearing of native trees and shrubs also does. For example, in a long-term cropping paddock, the ground cover is likely to be non-native, a crop, the shrub layer may be absent, and paddock trees present are native vegetation and require approval before removal. In an unimproved grazing paddock, the trees may be absent, but there is most likely to be native shrubs and native ground cover present that will most likely require approval before any treatment can commence. In summary, Managing any type and every strata of native vegetation generally requires some kind of approval. Land categorisation. As part of the native vegetation reforms made in 2017, a system of land categorisation was introduced and partly published by the Office of Environment, Energy and Science, or EES. The published land categories can be viewed on the internet under New South Wales Native Vegetation Regulatory Map. We've included the link to this with the other references at the end of the presentation. The published land categories are grey, excluded land, for example, national parks, orange, vulnerable land, which is generally steep or erodible areas, and pink, which is sensitive land, for example, set aside areas, remediation areas, or critically endangered ecological communities. Areas that currently remain in draft and unpublished are category one exempt land, and category two, regulated land. What this means for you is that we are currently in what is known as the transitional period. During this period, the onus is on you, the landholder, to determine what areas on your property are category one exempt land and category two, regulated land. Category one exempt land is defined as land cleared of native vegetation as at the 1st of January, 1990, or lawfully cleared after the 1st of January, 1990. Generally, this will be historically crop paddocks or areas with a history of rotational disturbances or permanent pasture improvement. An approval for clearing is not required in Category 1 exempt land, but it's also important to remember that while you might have a cultivation paddock that has been farmed continuously since 1990, any paddock trees that remain are likely to be small patches of Category 2 regulated land. Category 2 regulated land is defined as land not cleared as at the 1st of January 1990 or unlawfully cleared after the 1st of January 1990. This land will generally be areas of native pasture and remnant woody vegetation that has been present since 1990 and will require some form of approval to clear. Essentially, it's very important that you know the history of your property to be able to accurately determine the land category. We understand this can be difficult, especially if you've purchased a property recently. However, we're here to help with advice and can supply historical aerial imagery to assist you with your determinations. So what is compromised ground, native ground cover? Compromised native ground cover is ground cover where less than 50% of the vegetation cover is comprised of native species and at least 10% of the area is covered with vegetation, whether dead or alive. In some circumstances, Category 2 regulated land can be recategorised to Category 1 exempt land. This is where a compromised ground cover notification or a compromised ground cover voluntary certification could be used. You might be wondering, why would I undertake this process? 
This process could help you transform an unproductive area of non-native ground cover. For example, the top photo on this slide shows an area dominated by lithia into a highly productive cropping or improved pasture area, such as shown in the bottom photo. How do I assess my ground cover? The next part of the presentation provides guidance about how you can self-assess native grasslands and other native ground cover on your property and decide whether you are able to recategorise that area from Category 2 regulated land to Category 1 exempt land via completion of a compromise ground cover notification. Clearing of ground cover from Category 2 regulated land via the compromise ground cover notification is only authorised with an assessment and only if the following conditions can be met. One, less than 50% of the vegetation is comprised of native species and at least 10% of the area is covered with vegetation, whether dead or alive. Two, you must be able to identify native and non-native species. Three, the assessment must be undertaken when native ground cover is likely to be most actively growing. In the Northwest, this is during the summer months. The assessment can't be undertaken within six months of a significant disturbance such as drought, flood, fire or heavy grazing. Five, the percentage must be calculated in a scientific manner. And six, you cannot clear within buffer distances of a water body or if the area has been cleared using the pasture expansion part of the code. The assessment may be undertaken by a reasonable person that can successfully identify and distinguish between native ground cover species and non-native ground cover species. This could be a landholder or you could engage an external consultant such as an agronomist, ecologist, environmental consultant or local land services can do it for you as well. PlantNet, the New South Wales online herbarium, is the point of reference that is used for determining if a species is native or non-native to New South Wales. We have provided the link to PlantNet at the end of this presentation. How do I assess my ground cover? There are a few different methods available to use when undertaking a ground cover assessment, including the quadrant method and the step point method. We're going, we, use, sorry, we use and recommend the step point method because it's an easy and effective means of assessing ground cover. We're going to play a video now of how to do a step point ground cover assessment. Please give us a thumbs up if you can hear the audio. Sally and I are out in the field today in the Narrabri to give you a quick demonstration of how we undertake a step point transect for compromised ground cover assessment. We've already picked a random spot in the paddock representative of the area and run out our tape. Let's get into it. We have determined this area to be category two regulated land as there is no history of cultivation here. Prepare a field sheet like the example shown in our presentation to record your observations. It's a great idea to include GPS reference points and mark the assessment points on your map. Identify a patch that is representative of the native ground cover within the proposed clearing area. Walk 100 steps in a straight line or a transect across the selected patch. We've used the tape measure here to help reduce bias, but if you don't have one, you can step it out using uniform steps. At each step, record the ground cover type at the tip of your boot using the following categories. Native vegetation, non-native vegetation, bare ground and litter. It's important to note that only living plants can be counted in the assessment. If a standing dead plant is present, this is counted as litter. Repeat these steps in at least four other representative patches within the proposed clearing area, making sure to include any significant variability across the proposed clearing area. Common species that you might be surprised to find are native include roly-poly, galvanised burr and some of the species of yellow vine and pigweed. The point of reference for determining if a species is native or non-native is PlantNet. We've linked this website in the presentation. 
Be sure to take photographs that clearly show the ground cover. At least five random samples are recommended to be completed per 100 hectares and increase sampling in areas where vegetation varies significantly. There are many ways to randomly sample. If you're unsure of how best to do it, please get in touch with us. It's useful to record as much information as you can about the area such as list of ground cover species present, both native and non-native, history of ownership and land use, diary and paddock records, historical photos, any previous approvals or projects, any history of ground cover disturbance, and anything else you think might be relevant. When calculating the results, there's a few key points to be aware of. Ensure that 10% or more of the area is covered with vegetation, whether living or dead, and only include native and non-native results in the calculation as a percentage. In this example, we have calculated 260 out of 400 points were living, or 65%. Of the 260 points that were living, 155 were native vegetation, that's 60% and 105 points were non-native vegetation, which is 40%. So the outcome of this particular step point ground cover assessment example is that the area could not be considered as compromised ground cover because more than 50%, in this example it was 60%, of the vegetation cover is comprised of native species. Record keeping. The following records must be kept for at least five years from the date of clearing. 1. A map showing the proposed clearing area. 2. A record of the date on which the assessment was made. 3. A statement of how the assessment and calculation was made. And 4. Photographs that clearly show the type of ground cover at the time of assessment in the mapped area. 5. Other relevant information, such as a list of ground cover species present and paddock history. The more information you provide, the better. Your statement can include management activities in the area during the preceding six months, rainfall in the area in the preceding months, and as I said before, the list of ground cover species you identified, native and non-native. For assessments that we undertake for LLS, we take photographs that are stamped with a name, date, time, location and direction. This isn't mandatory, um, but it is an easy step to take that adds validity to the assessment. We use an app called Context Cam for this, and the photograph on this slide was taken using Context Cam, but there are many other apps available you can download, or if you have a GPS and you can mark your photo points, that's another option. So how do I submit a compromised ground cover notification? If the results of your assessment demonstrate that native vegetation is less than 50% of the total vegetation, and all the criteria we've discussed today are met, you can then submit a compromise ground cover notification. Firstly, undertake the ground cover assessment if the conditions we discussed can be met. Secondly, complete the notification form. You can obtain a form from your local LLS land management team member and you can also find it on the LLS website which we've linked to at the end of the presentation. Three, submit the completed form and a map to local land services. You could email it to the address that's found on the form or send it to your local LLS land management team member. Four, wait two weeks or 14 days after you've received the acknowledgement email. Five, 14 days after the successful submission of your notification, you can undertake ground cover clearing in the mapped area and the land will be recategorised from category two regulated land to category one exempt land after the clearing is completed. So where can you get some more help? Apart from LLS <laughs> team member, um, we've included the links referred to in the, earlier in the presentation here for your information. The Native Vegetation Regulatory Map, um, the PlantNet website, the LLS phone number, the LLS website, and a link to LLS land management fact sheets. We have a few minutes now few minutes now for questions that have come through. We're just checking if there's any that have come through. If you have any further questions after the presentation, please pop them in the comments or contact your local LLS land service officer. 
It doesn't look like we've had any questions come through, but as I said, please contact us. Please remember the advice provided today is general in nature and we strongly recommend you contact your nearest LLS office for individual advice on your property. We're here to help you. Thanks for tuning in to our information session. The next SMOCO session from LLS will be hosted by our NRM officer, Leonie Coleman, on the 23rd of November at 10 a.m. If you're interested in discovering what's happening in the Guida with birds, habitat and culture this summer, please jump on and check it out. Thanks for joining us.